and Jim and welcome back to another Meteorology Monday. Today we are going to be talking about um, the National Weather Service. That's right. So we have, or 50% of us, has some experience with the National Weather Service. It's not me, can you, you know. <laughs> but I know that we've been seeing a lot in our comments that some of you guys are interested in going into the National Weather Service. Um, I know it's like, you know, one of the biggest things that people who go to school for meteorology want to achieve at some point in their life. So today we will be discussing, you know, what it's like to work in the National Weather Service, what it takes to get there, and uh, probably some frequently asked questions that you guys have. That's right. So without further ado, <laughs> Let's go with the first question. Question number one is, uh, what school requirements do you have to fulfill while you're in college to get into the National Weather Service? Because there is a list of classes that you have to take to even be considered. So uh, that's right. So that. yeah. So uh, you know, each school that offers a meteorology program or has a meteorology department will have <clears throat> certain course criteria that is used, uh, especially if they do have sort of cooperative agreement with the National Weather Service, internships, or yeah. uh, just going ahead with full-blown employment. So they will have a list of all the academia requirements yep. to get you on board with them. Uh, yep. And and the NOAA Weather Service site actually has the list of requirements as well. Yep, and it, it I believe it also tells you which school's meteorology programs fulfill it. I That's think right. there's a list of the schools somewhere out there. That's right. So it's actually a whole lot easier to get that information now than it was back when I was going to school and trying to look for jobs in the National Weather Service. What year did you uh, begin your uh, National Weather Service journey, for the record? For the record. So I started college uh, in 1988, and in 1989 I started interning at the National Weather Service in Albany, New York and was there for about three years before graduating from State University of New York at Albany. And then right out of college you got a job again with the National Weather Service and where did you have to move to? <laughs> it wasn't far. Uh, Medford, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a 10 hour plane ride across the country, it's fine. That's right, that's right. And uh, there was a hiring freeze, a federal hiring freeze back in the day and there was only four positions open in the entire National Weather Service back then. And uh, the recruiters, uh, everything was out in the western region, which back then covered like Colorado, West California. And, um, you know, they went around to all the big schools, you know, and, and SUNY Albany was one of them. Big we all had to interview for these slots, and out of the four, I was able to get one of them. So. <laughs> and what happened? <laughs> not bragging or anything. <laughs> What helped me out a whole lot was the three years of internships working at the National Weather Service. I had some certifications under my belt already for upper air observation, hydrogen safety, uh, surface observations. So that helped me to you know place higher in, in the uh, people interviewing for the jobs. There you go. Let's move on to another question. Another big one is you probably have your heart set on a certain weather forecasting office that you want to work for. Say you went to school in, you know, Albany, New York, and there's a weather forecasting office in Albany, New York. Naturally, you probably want to work in <laughs> Albany, New York, right? But you ended up in Medford, Oregon. So do you get to pick the office that you go to or do you just kind of like get thrown a name and then uproot your life and move? Uh, when you apply for the National Weather Service, they had what was back then the SF-171, which is a federal uh, employment document to, to fill out, and you fill out basically uh, your top three areas where you want to go. Was Medford on your top three? I did not have much of a choice because there was only four positions. And it was Thanks. Missoula, Montana, Portland, Oregon, Yakima, Washington, and Medford, Oregon. Being up in Albany, New York at that latitude, I chose the furthest south latitude that I could possibly get <laughs> because I was tired of the winters. So, Medford, Oregon it was. There you go. <laughs> so Hot. Very hot in the summer. Hot and dry, but you know, it, eh, temperate I guess in the winter time. <laughs> Definitely not as cold as further north. But yeah, you know, you take what you can get. What always seemed to be the rule back in the day was uh, the one that you want the most put it as your least desired place because you might actually get it. For example, if you're really excited about tropical climates and you're coming from Minneapolis and you're going, I want Honolulu as my first thing 
99.97% chance you are not getting Honolulu for probably the first 12 years of your National Weather Service career. So welcome aboard. You're going 3,000 miles that way. <laughs> and uh, kind of sticking with the theme of, you know, kind of the opposite of what you want. Uh, tell us a little bit about the rotating schedule and the hours that you'll work at the National <laughs> Weather Service. Well, it depends on the Weather Service office. I had the pleasure of doing both a forward rotation and a backward rotation. When I worked at the Weather Service in Albany, they had three shifts. They had uh, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., and then 3 p.m. to 11. So kind of like hospital shifts. And they rotated forward. So if you were working 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., you'd work your X amount of days, and then the following week or whatever your days off were, you know, two days off, you know, the following time you come back to work, now you're working seven to three. And then you work until your weekend, whatever that happens to be, and then you work three to 11, and you, and you moved forward that way. That was actually good. In fact, they were one, one of the offices that was experimenting with what can be done shift-wise a little differently to accommodate people's lifestyles and have less of wear and tear on your body because working rotational shifts is very difficult. In Medford, Oregon though, their shifts actually went backwards and they had a total of five shifts. So let's say it was uh, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, so you would work those for your number of days on and then you'd have your weekend and then your next shift would be 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. you work those and then the next one would be midnight to 8 and it would go <laughs> It'd go backwards, and, and then it was four to midnight, and then noon to eight. I, I think those were the five, and it would go backwards. And on top of that, you would have, not to get too complicated, but you'd have three weeks of five days on, two day, three days off, or something like that, and then you'd have two weeks of six days on. So every time my six days came on, it was <clears throat> six to two was my first week of sixes, and then the following week was midnight to eight. So it literally, oh, with I had 36 hours to turn it around that when I was sleeping, I was awake, and then 36 hours later, it was now I'm awake when I was sleeping. And by the time I ended my 12 to 14 days of the six day sequence, uh, I was just spent. No thanks. <laughs> so, say that you finally, you finish school and you get a job at the National Weather Service. What all do you have to do once you start working there? So the National Weather Service has a bunch of different things, taking surface observations, uh, launching the weather balloons to take the upper air observations. You've got your forecasting, just your general public forecasting that, you know, we would see, you know, today, sunny, high 88, wind out of the south. Uh, and then you have your aviation forecaster that forecasts uh, specifically for the airports and, and the immediate area around there. You've got the uh, NOAA weather radio in terms of the uh, computer systems. Um, the forecasters put the warnings together, forecasts together, things like that. It goes to the NOAA weather radio. Uh, they have to know how that all works too because if for some reason that gets disconnected, they have to do it manually. Got to do it yourself. Like they did back in the day. <laughs> Um, and then uh, they have to probably have some IT experience too, um, to a degree, so that they know, know what, you're doing. what data is coming in. If the data doesn't come in, hey, you're expecting these forecast models to be available at a certain time, so you can put the forecast out. If it's not there, why? How do we fix this? <laughs> Where'd it go? You know? <laughs> How do I find it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of like uh, back in the day when we used to have uh, models that we just eh, we're just not going to send that today. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, excuse me, Mr. Senior Forecaster. What do we do at this point? <laughs> it's like you use the previous 12 hours and you start from now <laughs> in the forecast period. It's like, that's not good. <laughs> Using a 12 hour old radar and be like, I don't know if it's gonna rain or not. I don't know what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Thankfully nowadays, computers are 99% reliable. <laughs> Yeah, Most you know, you've time. got, yeah, they've definitely beefed up the infrastructure yeah. to allow that communication from the hub in DC to yeah. send out to the Weather Service offices. So yeah. it's much more stable now than it was. 
And uh, <laughs> speaking of back in the day, these days everything is computerized, so you can basically say the computer does it to some extent these days. But if you guys want to know what it was like back in the day when you did everything by hand and had grease pencils and weird <laughs> screens and like 700 monitors and dot matrix printers, uh, we can totally do another video. I'll come up with a list of questions and we'll quiz Dad on his uh, old school <laughs> forecasting knowledge. Since you know this was your job! The memories are burned in. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it'd be hilarious seeing you attempt to do it, what, like 30 years later? <laughs> So if you guys want that video, definitely let us know. Or if you don't want to see that at all because it'd be too tragic to see Dad try, <laughs> let us know that as well. <laughs> Me having nightmares all over again. <laughs> Messing up on the NOAA weather radio, reaching the last line, mispronouncing the city, and like, oh man, and then you gotta stop, start all over, erase the tape, re-record, what a mess. Because you guys, back in the day, you actually recorded the NOAA weather radio announcements. That yeah, we had to start blaring and stuff, and the person talking over the radio. I mean, that was part of your job. You, yeah. you were one of the little people on the radio. That's it. That's it. it what was so cool is that I would do the hourly weather forecasts, uh, the regular forecasts, uh, not the, the hourly weather forecast, the uh, hourly weather observations, and then the regular forecast, and then if there was any warnings or something like that. And then I'd go home and I'd turn my weather radio on and I'd hear myself on there and I'm going, I'm famous! <laughs> <laughs> Is that kind of like... Everybody's hearing me! <laughs> so like... <laughs> Is that like the equivalent of Googling yourself nowadays? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's or fantastic. watching your own YouTube videos. No, no, we never do that. <laughs> so now that we kind of know what's going on at the National Weather Service, to round out our experience today, let's talk about the hierarchy of each weather forecasting office. So uh, who's who, who's in charge, and who would you be when you join? That's right. So most of the time, let's say uh, you are just graduating from college and you landed your first job with the National Weather Service. Huzzah! So if you're coming in with a bachelor's degree, you'll come in as a uh, meteorological intern or the lowest level of meteorologist to things like GS5 or something like that. Way um, down under the <laughs> Yeah, and, and it may have, they may have updated since then, but um, I think with a master's degree, you come in at a level higher, and with a doctorate degree, right out of school, you come, come up with a Depends level just above that. How educated you be. That's right. And uh, you would go ahead and come in um, as uh, an entry level meteorologist and you'd work your way throughout the year. And as long as, I mean, basically you just did a good job, you're automatically promoted to the next level and you just keep doing that <clears throat> for your keep first climbing. few years. And then eventually you'll get up to uh, GS9, GS11, something like that. And then you get into what's called the journeyman forecaster or the journeyman meteorologist level which is kind of like your mid-range meteorologist, and you'll spend some time there. You may have to move from one weather service office to another, that's most likely the case. To have one person go through many different levels at one weather service office is very rare. They like you to move around, or at least they did back in the day, and uh, kind of helps you round out your meteorological skills and gives you an opportunity to see different parts of the country too, you know, if you're interested in that. Yeah. Um, like and, Bedford, Oregon, <laughs> yeah. Albany, New York. That's right. And then you get your GS11, GS12, and then from there you get promoted to, uh, I don't know if it, I don't think it's an automatic promotion, but you would look for now the next level of your career because you could be a GS11 or a GS12 for a while and then the next part would be your lead or senior forecaster GS13, GS14. Well not the boss well, but the senior the forecaster. <laughs> We're getting there hold on a second. It depends on what city you're in depends on what GS level because they do tweak things based on cost of living and so on and so forth but that's kind of the ballpark. So after that you could move on up to uh, they still have the positions you have your science and operations officer you have your data acquisition meteorologist. Does You've he acquire got, data? They are the ones responsible to make sure the data is coming in, that you are acquiring <laughs> the data. Those level of folks, you know, they, they need, you know, more, more, um, uh, what am I trying to say? They need more money? <clears throat> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. They have more job experience. And so, They've been you know, they're, a while. yeah, they're, they're moving up. Deputy meteorologist in charge, if they still have a deputy uh, position, that's the one step down from. The your, sheriff! The meteorologist in charge with the little, <laughs> the little badge. Sheriff badge. <laughs> so there's your GS14s-ish, somewhere's in there. And then uh, your GS15 
16 somewhere in there is your meteorologist in charge. So they're at the, the top, they're the top person that's there. All the way up there. That's right. And that would be your career in National Weather Service, should you stay. You, um, you could, back in the day, potentially make it to a senior forecaster position in, you know, seven to ten years, depending on if all the openings landed just right, you were doing your job well, and you were interested in moving. You didn't have to move, you just would stay in the position that you're at. And um, you do get a little bump, you just wouldn't, you know, in pay, but you just wouldn't get that big jump to the next GS level. <clears throat> but there's nothing wrong with that if you wanted to stay. You can do whatever you want. It's That's free right. country. It's free. <laughs> but there's the pathway to get from your entry level meteorologist all the way up to the person in charge. To the sheriff meteorologist. But that's pretty much uh, the hierarchy, and which you, you know, if you're interested to climb the ladder, there you go. The who's who's and the what's what's. That's right. And there we go. That concludes today's video. Thank you for joining. Um, <laughs> I am Professor Caleb. This is <laughs> Professor James. And <laughs> All right, if you like what you saw today, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe down below so you never miss another Meteorology Monday. And uh, like we were talking about, if you want to hear more about the National Weather Service or Dad's woes as the uh, uh, not automatic computerized forecaster that he was. But it was like back in the day <laughs> when we chiseled out forecasts on stone. <laughs> Circa, what, 1492? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit before that, but that's all right. Definitely let us know that down below in the comments. You can also follow us out on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and also our website as well. Until next time, I'm Kayla. And I'm Jim. Thanks for watching. And happy NWSing. So I don't know what question I'm about to ask, but he's going to answer it. <laughs>